So let's bust right into it. So we know this is kind of the reckoning that's been predicted in retail. Everyone's been talking about how retail was in for a fall because of stagnation of middle class wages, America being overstored, uh, just Amazon, a ton of different things, young people spending less money on stuff and more on experiences. But retail sort of soldiered on. It feels like the reckoning is finally here. And we're seeing just an incredible, um, incredibly challenging environment for uh, retail. Uh, between 1970 and 2015, over 45 years, malls grew faster, twice as fast as the population, sort of setting themselves up for a, a fall. It's no news. We just have too many malls. There's already been nine bankruptcies in retail year to date. So we're only one quarter into 2017, and we already have more bankruptcies than we did in all of 2016. At the same time, in terms of retail, people are spending as much, maybe a little bit more when they go to the store, but the footfall traffic to malls has been cut in half just in the last several years to give you a sense of how dramatic the decline is. In terms of store closures, we wanted to put up um, store openings as well because these talks always seem to be about how great Amazon is and how screwed everyone else is. There are winners. There are people breaking through in the face of competition and opening stores. But as you can see, there's a lot more that are closing stores. We purposely put up Amazon's fulfillment centers here as we believe that Amazon's fulfillment um, centers are effectively going to start serving as stores with click and collect. And at some point, when you can go, when you can drive up to an Amazon fulfillment center, pick up your stuff, or even perhaps go into the fulfillment center, is it a warehouse or is it a, is it a store? In terms of scale, Amazon has added $64 billion in growth since 2010. That's the size of Nordstrom, Macy's, and Sears. So they've essentially added these entire businesses to their top line over the last six years. To give you a sense of just how uh, powerful Amazon is in terms of a recurring revenue stream, more of an attempt to get an annual fee out of people in the form of Prime to subsidize what effectively has been a break-even business, even at its scale, with their retail platform. 44% of US households own a gun. 49% have a landline phone. Isn't that crazy? Only half of households now have a landline phone. 51% attend church. I think these are all the same people. Um, <laughs> and then that's, that, is, that joke goes over really well in New York. I'm in Tennessee tomorrow, and I will not say that. <laughs> I mean, like, these are real Americans. That's what I'll say tomorrow. 52% um, have Amazon Prime. So more people now have Amazon Prime than have a landline phone. To give you a sense of how technology shifted in America, there's a company that offers a service so you can get great retail delivered within two days. That's a technology that America has opted over versus a landline phone. About 55% of US households make over 50K a year. So they're almost in, these are the same people. The people in Amazon Prime are the same households that make over 55,000. What's unusual about Amazon, and one of the things that's unusual about it, is that usually a retailer that has discount as a core tenant of its value proposition attracts a lower income consumer, whereas Amazon is very much an urban, it's very much a high income uh, consumer. And then 55% voted in the election, and 78% decorate a Christmas tree. So, Amazon has changed more than just the face of retail. Amazon has essentially changed the relationship between companies and shareholders. And that is, it has replaced profits with vision and growth. And that has changed the entire ecosystem because companies or investors are no longer satisfied with a company that is not growing but profitable or growing slowly and profitable. They want something that has tremendous vision and is growing fast and they're willing to ignore a lack of profitability. This is Walmart versus Amazon's profits, Amazon being the gold. Effectively, Amazon runs their business at break even. I'm speculating, and Oliver uh, Chen, who's speaking about Amazon as an analyst, but I, my strong belief is that every time Amazon reports a quarter that's quite profitable, and there's all this coverage saying Amazon's not gone profitable, I think Jeff Bezos calls all his top management into a room and says, you screwed up. 
And we need to green light more massively expensive things that might give us advantage over the long term. But they've figured out that they don't need to run the company for profits. And once it becomes profitable, it's like getting an addict hooked on um, heroin and there's no taking it away. So they never let the company get very profitable. Why? They don't need to. Investors don't demand it of them. And as long as they can take all of that money and plow it back into the company, then what's the point of being profitable? And as a result, Amazon just plays by a different game. Amazon. Amazon has this reputation for being so innovative. And I would argue that all of you, if your bosses said you no longer need to make 20% profit on every dollar you bring in, you can be break even, that you'd be incredibly impressed with how innovative you can be. So loss is the new black. And now we have some very profitable companies in the Four Horsemen, Google and Facebook. Google, the original one, worth around $550 billion. Then Facebook, a little less profitable, worth about $420 billion. But the company that is probably the most impressive in terms of its own metrics of valuation relative to its peer groups, and that is it just justifies a valuation that no one can justify, is Amazon that is just not profitable, that runs literally at a break-even business. This has had a big impact on the ecosystem. So people always mimic the winner. And as a result, we have a series of private companies and the unicorns and the companies that we now admire have adopted this gestalt of growth and vision at the cost of profits. So you have WeWork valued at $16 billion, a $530 million business that's break even. Snap, which did about four or 500 million in revenue, but lost more. Its losses were actually greater than 500 million. And then you have Uber at five and a half billion in revenue and three billion in losses. Now you can argue this might not end well. This might be the wrong strategy long term. It might, it might have some underpinnings of something scary brewing in the economy. But the reality is, Retail investors love this model, vision, growth, and they ignore profits or a lack thereof. Amazon now has more people than Facebook, Google, and Apple combined working for them. But what's different is if you look at retail, Amazon, uh, Walmart, largest employer in the US, maybe in the world, generates about $90,000 in shareholder value for every employee. Macy's $140,000, $60,000 in market cap per employee. Sears effectively out of business, and then Amazon, 360,000, but $1.2 million in shareholder value. Now, given that that shareholder value or those options or that equity is a part of compensation, if the team with the best player wins, imagine what Amazon's advantage is relative to other retailers when they have $1.2 million in shareholder value per individual and they can offer some of that as compensation, whereas everybody else is really playing with a skirt, squirt gun compared to Amazon's bazooka. As, as a function of their compensation and their ability to recruit employees. They're getting into other businesses as a function of making this $99 a month, 51% of US households proposition even more attractive. Things that, that we never thought Amazon would get into. So Amazon Video and Amazon Media, or the part of the prime Amazon Television, two and a half billion dollars is how much HBO has allocated towards content, and all of us HBO has become such a part of the modern vocabulary in terms of the great content and series. series. They're going to spend $2.5 billion on original content this year. ABC and NBC are at about $4 billion. Amazon, the retailer, is going to spend $4.5 billion on original content this year. The only one that's bigger than this is Netflix is at $6 billion. And this is Netflix's core business. Just to give you a sense of how much fun it is to play in traffic when you have almost infinitely cheap capital. You can take a non-core business and almost overnight compete uh, you know, with the biggest players in the business. Amazon is now spending more on content. The major broadcast networks are HBO in an attempt to get you to pay 99 bucks. And they can monetize it differently. They're not going to ask you for $19.95 a month, which HBO asks you for. They're going to ask you for $99 a year, which you get a ton of other benefits for. Sort of the overlooked middle, middle child, we don't talk a lot about it, Amazon, is Amazon's media group, which has become a very big business sort of under the radar. Advertisers report that uh, Amazon is, in fact, their favorite DSP in terms of where to allocate their revenue, in terms of who they enjoy working with most. If, they, if we can assume, if we translate the margins on their business is the same as the, the margins on Facebook's business, they're producing about $400 million a year and profits from their media business, which means that despite being a, a pimple on the elephant in terms of their top line revenue, the media group now does about a fifth of the profit of the entire company. And this is an adjunct business. They're now bigger than Twitter, 
And uh, excuse me, they're about half the size of Twitter, and they're obviously bigger than Snapchat. Think about all the heat, $23 million valuation for Snapchat. And Amazon Media Group uh, is a business that is three times the size of Snapchat. So what's next? Uh, I think that effectively you have a company that has conspired with about a billion consumers and technology to destroy brands. I think their attitude is that brands have, for a long time, earned this unearned price premium that screws consumers. The attitude of uh, an association and shorthand to get to a good product at a very expensive price because you don't want to do the diligence across all these other products, the brand charges a premium for that shorthand or that diligence. And Amazon has said, I know, using technology, and a billion people who will write reviews and then putting algorithms, we can destroy that price premium that brands have commanded through consistency and all this advertising and all these things like packaging and shelf space and end cap and in-store promotions, that we can go after that. It really doesn't add any value. And we can destroy it, you and me, the consumer, with our software and our scale and start sucking the margin away from brands and give it back to you the consumer. I think this is effectively a war on brands. If you look at all the money that is spent by brands and CPG on shelf space, on marketing, on creating demand, the partnership, the skill they need, the massive amount of money they spend on relationships with retailers, Amazon doesn't need to do any of that. Amazon has said none of that is important to the end consumer, that we can take all of that margin and give it back to the consumer. And then you go online, and there's less of that. So brands are at a bit of a disadvantage uh, online because they don't have as much opportunities to portray all these amazing things they've invested in at the point of purchase. They're not as obvious or as valuable online. And the typical brand building investments have less purchase or less justification, less value when we go online. Now, where do brands absolutely almost not matter at all? What is banishment? What is being put on an ice flow in the world of brand? I think it's voice. And if you look at activity on voice and on Google, the number of people or the number of searches or voice requests that have a brand as a modifier or a prefix before a request is declining. When Google came out, when Google launched, I think the sun had passed midday on the era of brand. We all have this gestalt. Um, I, I, I have had it for 25 years. I've made a nice living espousing that brand is everything. And there's this reflex reaction in the business world that brand is still sacrosanct. And I think Google and now Amazon have decided all the money, all the price premium that's required to support this intangible called brand building is money we're going to give back to the consumer. The consumer is starting to not care or not find value in all this quote unquote brand building. What are people using Echo for? Right now they're just using it to get information. If you have kids, it's a ton of fun, geography, jokes, Amazon, or Alexa is by far the most popular device in my household right now, but it's not being used for shopping. Where is it gonna go? It's pretty clear where voice is gonna go based on the company. So Apple will use voice for media. Google will use voice for search and information so it can monetize it with advertising. And the way Amazon monetizes things is through commerce. So it's likely you're going to see a huge effort on the part of Amazon to turn Alexa into a frictionless, brandless means of ordering all the stuff you need in your household. My prediction is within two to three years, Amazon launches something called Prime Squared, where it takes artificial intelligence, your purchase history, your credit card history, these dots you have around your house, and says, tell you what, we'll be your only retailer. You don't need to go ever shop anywhere else. We're going to send you two boxes twice a week using this unmatched fulfillment infrastructure. One's going to have the stuff in it we think you want. And in the second box, is going to be empty. And just put the stuff you don't want back in the second box, send it back. We'll recalibrate, calibrate using Dot or Alexa, just say Alexa more pork, more bacon, less beer, barbecue on Saturday for six people, send me three quotes for auto insurance for a 2014 Toyota camera via email. The easiest way to get stuff done, and 95%, maybe 98% of our purchases are low value, low consideration, tedious purchases. I think Amazon's gonna say to a series of households, tell you what, you don't need any other retailer, we're it. 
The company is going to announce that those households are going to quintuple or sextuple in purchase volume, and the stock is going to become the first trillion dollar market cap company in the history of business. So what happens with voice? How is Amazon going to get to penetration and help get traction or adoption around using Alexa for consumption and for shopping? And they're already getting there, and they're getting there through price. So if you go on Amazon, you'll see that the number one recommended detergent around the Gain brand is Gain, Gain, Gain Fling's original laundry detergent packs, 81 count for $18.97. However, when you ask Alexa, buy Gain laundry detergent. Amazon's choice for laundry detergent is Presto liquid laundry detergent, 96% bio-based. Fragrance-free, 106 loads. It's $19.59, total including tax. It was 18.48 30 minutes ago. <laughs> I think Amazon got word I was going to trash them, and it's really it's screwing with us right now. Alexa, buy L'Oreal mascara. Amazon's choice for L'Oreal mascara is L'Oreal Paris, Illumina's original mascara. Carbon black, 0.26 fluid ounces. It's four dollars and eighty-nine cents total, including tax. So the majority of the products that we did this test on, if you ordered through Alexa, you got a lower price than what you could find on Amazon. Alexa, buy baby wipes. Water wipes, baby wet wipes, natural and chemical free. Seven hundred twenty wipes. It's twenty-four dollars and. So it's clear that Amazon has decided to give people a discount when they order through voice as opposed to going on Amazon, where obviously the prices are pretty low. And this is obviously going to cost them a lot of money, and they've made a, they've made a conscious decision to make a huge investment to encourage more adoption of purchase through Alexa. Alexa, buy batteries. Amazon's choice for batteries is Amazon Basics, AA batteries, 48 pack. It's $13.60 total, including tax. Would you like to buy it? No. I also found 20 pack of Amazon Basics triple of performance alkaline batteries. It's $7.61 total, including tax. Would you like to buy it? No. That's all I can find for batteries right now. So Alexa, knowing that you don't have the visual cues of other brands, has decided to tell you that Amazon private label batteries are the only batteries available, despite the fact there are numerous brands available on Amazon. I think this is where we're headed. I think Alexa and Amazon have conspired and figured out that voice is a way to pull brand and some of the traditional mechanisms and accoutrement of brand building out of the ecosystem and then slowly but surely take control of your preferences, and your preferences are about to become the product that Amazon makes the most margin on or Amazon private label. And we're going to see a further death in the world of traditional brand building. So some summaries. Uh, Amazon really is, in my opinion, conspiring with technology and a billion consumers to say we have declared full wholesale war on brands. There are going to be some brands that are successful. If you think about what typically works with the Amazon algorithm, it's one of two things. It's either a hot independent brand that's getting great reviews and is a, a very specific indication and is getting tremendous buzz and that gets put to the top. Or it's a good brand that, for whatever reason, is an amazing deal that day that's on sale. And the algorithm literally goes out every nanosecond and tries to find the best value for the consumer. Most big brands are neither of those things. Most big brands are good brands, not hot brands, not up and coming brands, not the cool independent brand that's getting a ton of buzz, a good brand that commands a premium. It's not great value. It's a good price, but it's not a great price. So traditional short tail CPG large conglomerate brands are just not what Amazon is recommending, nor will they recommend. So you have one company that's soaking up all of the retail growth that's essentially decided the brands of yesterday are just that, they're yesterday. 
Algorithms versus partnerships. If you think about your traditional retail partnerships, they are partnerships with big barriers of entry. It's hard to get into Macy's. It's expensive. There's a lot of human interaction, but once you're in there and they're making money and you're making money, it's a wonderful partnership that they continue to reinvest in. They're patient. It might sound like a difficult relationship where they're asking for, uh, asking for a lot, but you haven't seen difficult until an algorithm is willing to trade you off for any other of a hundred different brands in a nanosecond because for whatever reason, the algorithm has decided that that exact moment, you are not the best deal for the consumer or for Amazon. It's an algorithmically driven retailer, which is a nightmare for traditional brands that have the scale to develop these relationships, to advertise, to get shelf space. Amazon doesn't care about any of those things. Storytelling is the new competence in business. We saw this firsthand at L2, and that is when we started L2, I was born in an age or came of age in business where you were tr trying to get to profits. That was the goal. And my first company, Profit Brand Strategy, I was really proud because within the first two years, we got to profitability. And the way I've always tried to run companies is to grow them between 20 and 40% a year and maintain somewhere between a 30 and 40% EBITDA margin. And that's what we were doing at L2. We were growing about 30 or 40% a year, and we were getting somewhere towards 30% operating margins. And then the venture capitalists came in, very smart guys, and said, Scott, you're going about this all wrong, and put a bunch of money into the company and said, take it to 70% growth and lose a lot of money, but become more special and have technology at the center of your company and establish a leadership position that no one can argue with based on this 70% versus 30% growth. That was massively uncomfortable for me to see every month us hemorrhaging money. 36 months after we took that money, the valuation of our company went up about tenfold. So they were right. So this is the new gestalt in our economy, and that is to establish leadership, to grow at all costs, even if it means losing a lot of money. And I still don't know if this story ends well. There's something uncomfortable about that approach to business. Death has a name and its voice. I think when we look back on the death of brand, if you will, or how a lot of the margins get starched out, when Kraft Times comes after Unilever, they're basically saying, you need to cut costs. And if you don't, we're gonna come in and do it for you. And overnight, a couple hundred thousand CPG executives lost their job. They just don't know it. Because now in every boardroom of every CPG company, they're saying, we've either got to cut costs or someone's going to come in and take us over and do the same thing for us. And at the end of the day, that cost cutter, that destroyer, that voice sharpening the, the knife is one, Google, two, Amazon's algorithms, and now it's going to be voice. Voice-based technologies are taking over the world. Alexa, who is Scott Galloway? Scott Robert Galloway is an Australian professional football player who plays as a fullback for Central Coast Mariners in the A-League. Really? That is literally the funniest thing my children have ever seen. <laughs> and three to four times a day, they invite me into the room as if they're, we're doing something else, and my six and nine-year-old ask that question of Alexa and wait to see my disappointment and just <laughs> writhe on the ground with joy. They think it's the funniest thing ever. And we did this on a winners and losers because we thought it would be funny. And then I got a note in the comments section from somebody who said, Scott, yeah, who said, Scott, love your videos. This is a gift to you. And he gave me a link to a wiki page. And now I have a Wikipedia page, which scares the shit out of me because I don't know what's going to end up on this thing. <laughs> so Alexa, who is Scott Galloway? Scott Galloway is a clinical professor of marketing at the New York University Stern School of Business, public speaker and entrepreneur. Boom! 